Welcome back, everyone. Wasn't that terrific? Rini's music is inspiring, and we are so proud she calls Nova Scotia home. I also hope you found time to check out the booths and visited the Lounge to Network. Don't forget, if you need any support using the platform, send a message to any of the attendees named event staff in the People tab, and they will be able to help you with any technical questions that you may have. Before we continue with our programming, I want to take a minute to thank all the people who came together to make today possible. Events like this are a large undertaking and their success depends on the collaboration and camaraderie from design to implementation. So thank you to our platinum supporter, ACOA, Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, our gold supporter, EDC, Export Development Canada, and our silver supporters, BDC, Business Development Bank of Canada, and LSI, the Nova Scotia Department of Labor, Skills, and Immigration. This morning's presentations were fantastic. Thank you to TK Manimo, Perm Jot Valia, Jennifer Lesperance, and NSBI's very own Peter McCaskill for your leadership in our workshops. And of course, a very big thank you to our event participants today. Your energy, your questions, and information sharing make all the difference in these sessions. Let's keep the momentum going. For this afternoon's sessions, we have three more workshops for you to choose from. And up next at 1.15 is our second panel discussion Growing Nova Scotia's Exploring the True Impacts of Innovation. Our thanks to ACOA for the support for this panel discussion. At NSBI, I'm very proud to be able to lead a team of creative, innovative thinkers who are always trying to figure out how we can promote a culture of innovation, take smart, calculated risks to drive progress, and how we can best support Nova Scotia companies to succeed on a global stage. And one of the ways we do that is by making sure that our programs are key to spurring and supporting positive innovative change for businesses across the province. Three that I would highlight are the digital adoption program, which supports companies to implement machinery and equipment upgrades and adopt technology to build or improve e-commerce and enable remote working, the digital marketing asset development program, which supports businesses to develop custom digital marketing videos to elevate their virtual international sales and the innovation rebate program, which helps businesses increase innovation capacity through capital investment and the adoption of new technologies and business processes. The IRP program announced earlier will help Nova Scotia's advanced manufacturing companies invest in themselves, as our minister said, through product development, improvements in production, reducing or finding new uses for waste, strengthening supply chains to enable production in Nova Scotia, and investment in production capacity to enter new markets, all of which improves competitiveness. You'll hear more about these and other innovation initiatives in the next session, so let's get started. To moderate the innovation discussion, I am very pleased to introduce Chuck Maye, Vice President at ACOA, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. Over to you, Chuck. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurel. And thanks, everybody, for joining us at the Growing Nova Scotia, Exploring the True Impacts of Innovation discussion panel. As Laurel said, I'm Chuck Mayet. I am the Vice President at ACOA, the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. Delighted to moderate this session uh, from home today. Uh, planning to be at work, but the snow day uh, means I'm working from the living room again. So apologies if there is a preteen behind me getting crayons or a dog barking. I will try to minimize the inter interruptions. Uh, so listen, at ACOA, we are focused on driving the Atlantic growth strategy, and we've got several programs and business supports available to your company to stimulate economic growth in the region. And now more than ever, it's time to take action. Uh, Government of Canada, we work very closely with the four provinces and Atlantic Canada with that common goal of fostering stable and long-term economic prosperity. I'm not going to talk about some of those programs. We have a panel coming up later, and my colleague Joe Cashin will be doing a, a great job of that. Uh, our goal here today is really to hear from, from some of the, 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 the innovators and the businesses that have gone uh, through this journey. So, and it, it, listen, it's obvious innovation is the key to long-term success of any business. And whether it's adopting new technologies or business accelerators, innovation is thriving in Atlantic Canada. And I'm pleased to be joined here today by our panelists who are shining examples of innovation leadership and having true impacts here in Nova Scotia. They have terrific stories and experiences to share. So let's get things rolling. Uh, first up is Matt Sims. 
Matt's a serial entrepreneur and a self-described recovering academic. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Matt and his team provided guidance to more than 1,800 business leaders with a series of early stage webinars to help organizations get oriented and prepare for the pandemic. And as a result of these efforts, Matt was named 2021 Business Leader of the Year in Nova Scotia. Next up, we have Ben Garvey. Ben is the co-founder and CEO of Ingenuity, amongst other uh, businesses that he leads. Ingenuity is a creative uh, design engineering firm here in Halifax. Uh, using a client-centric approach, Ben and his highly capable team wrap themselves around a client challenge, and the team at Ingenuity is on a mission to be Canada's most impactful engineering and design group. Our next panelist will be Kevin Pelly. Kevin is the CEO of Coltec International. Uh, for more than 35 years, the Coltec name has been synonymous with the uncompromising craftsmanship and unparalleled performance of the industry's best windows. Uh, Ken's a past president of the Canadian Window and Door Manufacturers Association. And uh, just as an aside, did a home rental last year. I've got beautiful Coltec windows here that I'm looking at snow falling. So they work great and they keep me warm. So good job, Kevin. Good job, Kevin. Uh, and last but certainly not least is Todd Coombs. Todd is the Director of Regional Business Development with NSBI with over 15 years of experience in business operations, corporate strategy, and project management. Todd, let's start with you. Uh, tell us about some of the tools that NSBI has to help companies innovate for the future. Yeah, thanks for that very much, uh, Chuck. I mean, you know, at NSBI, there's a lot of different programs that that businesses in different sectors and different stages of their growth that they can access. Um, you know, first, right off the top, we have the export development program, uh, and that has three streams in that uh, in that program. That program really will help you travel the market to meet your clients when when that uh, when that day comes. Uh, then the next thing with that stream, there's is a little bit of the consulting help. Um, so you can engage folks like Matt, uh, folks like Ben to help you work through issues that uh, or or opportunities that you're looking at. Um, so that's what that stream will help you out with. And then also for tech adoption um, in stream three and stream three really was um, came out of COVID uh, where we had a lot of our local businesses that were really trying to innovate. Uh, working on their products, but they didn't have the necessary skills and uh, equipment to <laughs> to do fully transition to a virtual virtual work. Uh, so the stream three really helps you out with that. I mean that that is one of the the easy easiest programs that you can get into that can really help you take your business to that next level, innovate on on several different fronts. It's very very versatile. We also have our product innovation uh, voucher program, and that's uh, that program is a really interesting program to help you. I mean, innovations in its title, but uh, really, it's really getting you connected with the post secondary institutions. We have a lot a lot of horsepower in in the institutions that are in Nova Scotia. We're very fortunate that way. But sometimes the connection between the institutions and actual businesses that are working on innovative things uh, is not there. This program program bridges that gap for folks um, and it's and it's a really great vehicle to get you introduced into the horsepower that is there and and that goes for for both sides of it we also have other programs digital access uh, digital marketing programs that help you again this was a it came out of covid was <clears throat> we have clients we're so used to jumping on a plane and going and selling and, and working with our clients uh, in their regions but all of a sudden uh, I can't do that. I can't get on that plane. I can't do. I can't go visit. So how do you do that? So how do you transition from, you know, knocking on the door, boots on the ground, to actually uh, having to do virtual? Uh, and that program was a really great way to do that. I, I mean, I could go on and on and on about the the number of programs that we have. Um, there's there's a lot of different things there, and it's always changing. The number one thing that I would say to the the businesses that are here today with us is to make sure that they're reaching out to the folks on the regional team that's in their area. Um, we're very well equipped to help you navigate the num the numerous amounts of uh, programs that are out there. And, you know, it's not a individual sport here. It's not only about NSBI because we work with folks on Chuck's team at ACOA and BDC, EDC, because um, if we're talking to a company and we find something that potentially will help you and it's not an NSBI driven program, but I know about it, um, we're going to send you to the right contact. So it's it's really, really important for those innovative businesses that are trying to conduct business. We want you working on your products, not necessarily trying to, you know, circle around trying to find something that's going to help you. Um, so that's something that uh, that really is, is works well. It's a, very much a team sport. Uh, 
Oh, I think oh, Chuck's wow, froze. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I did such I a great job and knocked him right off the connection. <laughs> yeah. You need a little digital access program for him, man. <laughs> That's called Murphy's Law. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think what I only thing I would add, Todd, to what you what you had said is that you know, as soon as you understand the gap between where you're going and where you are. Uh, that's the time to start to talk to guys like you and Chuck and yeah. go like, what support do you guys have to help us go faster? Sorry, yeah. Chuck, you're back there. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think we had a bit of technical challenges there. Todd, um, Minister made a great announcement this morning on IRP. Can you maybe just touch base on that in terms of what that's going to look like, how it's going to, if it's going to change from the old IRP that we knew and, and, and the impact yeah. that you see that happen? That's a that's a great point. Thanks, Chuck. The uh, I mean, the innovation rebate program or IRP is, is you know, when we go in the alphabet soup kind of stuff there. Um, uh, IRP was a great the, the pilot program that ran for five years was a really great program. And I've worked with everyone here actually uh, on this panel today on different aspects of programs that helped companies all across the province. And and that's one of the great things about this program is to really emphasize is the program, the pilot itself really was not Halifax centric. It was spread across all across the province, um, very rural communities into the Halifax uh, core as well. So that was really, really great to see small businesses um, with a few people to larger businesses. The program really is not, it is the, the revised programs taking all the great things that we learned from the pilot programs um, and just rolling them into one. Um, so there's, you, you can expect a lot of the same thing. And, and really, at the end of the day, if you're a manufacturing processor that is um, looking to increase your productivity, increase uh, your, 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 your sustainability, if you're looking to increase any of your production capabilities, this program can really, really help you uh, get to that next step. Um, you know, a couple examples that I had had through my time working on the program is one pro a company that was looking at a particular uh, processing system. And with what the program, with the, the addition of the program, they were able to get the, the next processing system that could help them get to that next level. So at one level on their own, they could afford one product, but really wasn't the best product for them. It would help them, but only help them for a year. What this helped them with how this program works is it does give you a rebate back on what you spent. And this helped them get the right size program, the right size processing equipment for their needs versus buying what they could afford right at this point in time. So it really helps you leverage and get you in the right processing equipment that will help you get to that next level. Um, so we're really, really looking forward to pro starting the, to open up those applications and start processing them uh, and really help as many businesses as we possibly can through that program. Great, thanks. It's a great program. I think we lost Chuck again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. So, you know what, here I can take this. So Kevin, um, actually, because we're just on the heels of IRP, uh, yes. Kevin, you were one of the companies um, that that used the innovation rebate program. Can you tell us a little bit what what innovation means to you at Coltech and your team? Um, and how do you set yourselves apart with that? Yeah, so uh, listen, thanks to NSBI for organizing this great event. Um, so impressed with uh, everything so far. Rainy Smith at lunchtime, wow. What a talent we have. And uh, I, I just have to say, as a humble Nova Scotian, that I am so proud of what we do as a province and how we compete outside this province on a worldwide stage. When I travel across the country and the U.S. and meet our, right, go to other plants and meet our customers, I am just so happy about um, hearing stories like, wow, you guys are good, you're innovative. And I know that starts from our roots in Nova Scotia. So just a huge shout out to us. And, and SBI is helping us to, in many cases, to sort of uh, champion some of those efforts. But I do, first and foremost, I do believe that business is about relationships. I think that's key to success. You have to build a good quality product. You have to provide good service. But I think relationships is important. But beyond that, um, it, innovation... I get a little bit of feedback there. Is that me or? Sorry. Uh, beyond that, I think you have to be innovative in your business. You know, for example, we build a product 
Uh, and we do it with, um, you know, good quality, with service in mind and, and looking after our customers. But it's important that we have to look at all parts of our business to be innovative, not just in our products, but every touch point with our customers. We want to make sure that we're making it easier for them to do business with us. We want to make sure that we're taking the waste using uh, an engineering, uh, in, you know, uh, lean engineering principle, take waste out of the process. And the more you can... Uh, develop innovative products and more innovative systems with your customers, um, the more successful you'll be. Uh, you know, years ago, uh, a gentleman I, work, gentleman I worked for said there's two races out there. One is to the top and one is to the bottom. And the race to the bottom is all about price. And that's not a fun game. It's very competitive and not everybody wins at it because not everybody knows their cost. So sometimes you're competing against a competitor who's below market, below cost, and that's tough. So what you want to do is you want to be in that race for the top. You want to build innovative products. You want to have innovative systems for your for your customers, um, for your suppliers, and, and, and for your employees. You have to be innovative nowadays with your employees. The demand for employees, hard to get employees, hard to onboard employees, hard to keep employees. So you really want to foster that spirit of innovation in all aspects of your business and take waste out of whatever you do and, and create a situation where people want to do business with you. Okay, I, I think I'm back. Um, can folks hear me now? Yes. Great, sorry. And, and Kevin, I did, I did catch most of that. So I think it was just something on my end here. Uh, ben, maybe, uh, and, and thank you for those points and thank you for touching on the, on the issue of, of, of talent as well, which is uh, certainly something that we're hearing. Ben, tell us about Ingenuity's team approach to problem solving and the steps that you can tell, take to help clients find solutions. Sure. Well, thanks for that, Chuck, and, and thanks, Todd, and Kevin, and, and Matt, and everyone uh, on the panel here. It's, this is really cool to be part of and fantastic to, uh, to see this going on. I mean, we, we have such an amazing uh, set of infrastructure here with, with ACOA, NSBI, and, and the supporting groups around us. It's... I don't think most Nova Scotians really understand how lucky we are with with the uh, infrastructure we have and support here. It's just it's fantastic. So shout out to all you guys first, you know, and uh, and the work you you all do. Um, so I mean, you know, it, Kevin uh, touched on a, a lot of the points already. You know, it's 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 a difficult world. We're not competing locally anymore. We're competing globally. Um, so all of the problems we face, they're, they're really multifaceted, they're inherently complex, they're inherently linked, um, they're, they're not, you know, it used to be you could be a, a relatively decent mechanical guy and, and solve problems, uh, that's not the case anymore, you can't, you have to be multifaceted, you have to be um, multidisciplinary, and, and that's the kind of um, team that we're building here at Ingenuity, that's the, that's kind of the drive behind what we do, you know, we bring um, experts in all all fields, um, whether it's you know industrial design, uh, human factors, um, agricultural um, systems, aeronautical stuff, marine systems. Um, you have to have electronics engineers. You have to have uh, firmware guys, software guys. It it becomes this um, multifaceted team to tackle even simple problems anymore because they're not simple. Uh, they really are interlinked and, and interdisciplinary. Um, and so, you know, bring, bringing those resources together is, is kind of step one. And um, step two is, is then what, what Kevin um, uh, referred to already, which is the relationship. You know, you can't just fire a whole bunch of uh, people in a room and say, we're, we're going to solve a problem. You have to build the, build the excitement around it, build the uh, understanding, uh, build a rapport with the, with the people involved. And, and um, Approach it all as kind of a unified um, front with with curiosity, and and that's the big word for us is is uh, you know ask the questions, ask one more question, ask one more question, uh, be be curious and get to the root of the problem because sometimes you know what you're looking at initially is just um, that's just the the symptom if you like it's not the actual uh, problem that you're solving. So really getting to the core. Uh, of the problems, um, and, and and that's uh, that's kind of the mantra that we work with here. Um, start with the discovery, really, really workshops. Put put the put the effort in up front and workshop what the problem is, um, so that you know exactly what you're trying to solve before you go and solve it. You know, too many times we rush out and say, "Ah, I can fix that," um, 
but in fact, that wasn't the real issue. <laughs> you know, and listen to everybody. Everybody's got uh, good input to this. You know, it doesn't have to be the the CEO or the operations manager. You know, quite often some of the most useful input we've had um, from uh, from problem solving is is that last five minute conversation as you're walking out of the building with your notes from the day's review and you stop and the maintenance guy's coming in to clean the machine that you've been asked to try and solve the problem with and the maintenance guy goes oh yeah this has been happening and and uh you know i don't know what's causing that and that just tweaks it you go okay wait a minute that's related to this now we have some more information about the people using the problem and it, you know it's it's really being open to all of the sources of information treating them with the, with the right level of priority and uh, trying to wrap uh, then, then you wrap the team around that problem and say, "Okay, everybody, let's chew on this. Uh, here's our objectives." But, but nailing those objectives down first are so key. You can waste a lot of time uh, solving the wrong problems if you're not really careful about it. Ben, you've been around this long enough. Are, are you seeing kind of certain kinds of clients that do best, or, or is there a certain kind of mindset that you're looking for in terms of kind of who gets it and, and, and who doesn't? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's a curiosity that uh, comes back to the curiosity and the willingness to just say, okay, um, well, there's got to be a better way. It, it, the folks who were able to say, you know, Kevin obviously uh, referred to that earlier and say, look, we're not in a race to the bottom. I'm not competing with my uncle down the road here. I'm not competing with the fish plant um, across the province. I'm on a world stage. And um, the folks that can, that can um, kind of get away from the, provincial approach of, well, I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody about what I'm doing uh, because this is my trade secret. It's the folks who can get over that and say, well, look, let's work on these problems together uh, to solve the bigger issues and to make the whole industry better. Those are the folks that are really, um, you know, they, they come to it with an honesty, a curiosity and a generosity um, that, that builds relationships that really brings um, positive and lasting growth. Uh, those are the folks that we're seeing that really uh, really succeed in the, in the long run you know they're not they're not um, they're looking outside they're looking at the bigger picture they're looking after their staff um, and anticipating changes coming in the door and we, we, we love working with those folks they're great fun great um, Matt so simplicity designs uh, in the midst of a pandemic you know leading an organization named business leader of the year, uh how did you how did your approach you know to the pandemic carve out the success and and you know what were some of the common issues that you or the team at simplicity uh helped the organization solve maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your journey over the past two years yeah uh you know i, I want to echo what everybody else said you know early on there's a lot of great minds in this province uh, a bunch of them are sitting on this call uh, a bunch of them aren't sitting on this call and you know it I think when you head into the unknown, uh, if you head into it with a growth mindset, uh, a lot more comes out of it. And, you know, we, we've got to move from this good and bad binary world to it is and everything you're doing everywhere could be better and is likely being done better by someone somewhere. And when we first approached the pandemic, you know, you mentioned that recovering academic thing. Um, I, I, I'm a recovering historian and we didn't look back at, you know, a stock crash in 2008. We looked back to 1917, 18 influenza pandemic and went, oh boy, this is going to be three years of hell. And we got to get our head around three years of uncertainty leading organizations. And so the very first thing that we asked all of our clients to do is the thing that we did. We, we went back and it, you know, it almost sounds corny, but I'm going to say it, you we, we looked at why do we exist? Why do we start this thing? What's our purpose? And, and when we, you know, when we started this thing nine years ago, it took us about two years to get to the true purpose statement, make the world a better place, one organization at a time focused in Atlanta, Canada. And the very first thing we did, Trudeau came on, announced the world was closing down, Canada was closing down. And we went, okay, here's our purpose. And we looked and we had about 40, 42 clients that were ongoing at that point. We, we knew they were canceling their days. So we got to work and said, okay, what problem do they solve for who? What's the value of solving that problem? And how has this just changed? And we had a three page document done up on every company that we were actively working with over the next three days. 
that did two things. First, it, it centered us on our purpose. Second, it put our clients and their problem at the forefront. And I think a third thing, I know I said two things, but the third thing is it got the team working on productive things. They weren't paralyzed anymore. We, we were able to move the finish line a little bit closer and get moving. And we got those two page documents done. We got in contact with all of our clients. We sent them out. And then we realized this is a much bigger problem. And we started hearing from past clients and it was just paralysis. People were just, they were, you know, we often talk about the fight or flight response. People don't realize that there's a third F in there. It's freeze. And over 90% of the time, that's what people do. They freeze. They don't fight or flight. They freeze. And so what we wanted to do was get out of that frozen state. And so we literally just started on a loop. How do you start outside in? What problem do you solve for who? What's the value of solving that? How has that changed? Is it a permanent change? Is it a temporary change? Okay, based on that, what capabilities do you need to reshape? Process, technology, et cetera. As a result of that, what skill sets do you now need to have, right? I mean, we went from basically no marketing team and 100% in person to a 13 person marketing team and 100% online over the course of three and a half months. But no choice. That's how we had to connect now, right? That was a bit of our innovation, but we were working clients through that same process. But I would say, you know, Ben talked about getting a lot of like-minded and differing views in the room. One of the most important things for any organization that's looking, go that's looking at going from local to global is to really stop, step back and go, what problem do I solve for who? Not what, not what do you create? I didn't ask you, what do you create? What widget? I asked you, what problem do you solve? And what is the value of solving that? Because as you start to get outside of Atlantic Canada, which we all have to do now, you're going to find that you're going to become more niche and you are for less people. But if you do it right, you can drive a higher value. Critical to know that equation. So, you know, that's, that's what we did. And that's what we tried to lead. Um, I'm not saying it was easy and I'm not saying it wasn't exhausting though. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. It just, so, so on niche, do you do you see that uh, emerging as as you know one of Atlantic Canada's value propositions in terms of how we can drill down into niche higher value markets? Is that where we should be thinking a bit more? I think you have to, and I think the bigger you get, the more concentrated you need to be, and that's because you you can't be the general shop because you won't be good at any of it. One of the questions that I ask my clients all the time is, "What are you terrible at in the service of great?" If you can't answer that question, my guess is you're perfectly average at everything and you're not going to compete outside of maybe a few yes and contracts, right? So, and, and you can't build a capability for that degree of flexibility of service. So as you start to scale, it's got to be repeatable. It's got to be, it's got to be something that you can operationalize without having to rely on this um, extreme skill set that has ultimate flexibility. Right. So as you start to scale, it's got to be more repetitive. Um, and if that's the case, it's got to be niche down. And you got to watch out because if you're not supplying a market that values what you're able to do, don't don't start scaling it. Right. I, I talk to businesses all the time in the 300 to one million dollar range. And the first thing that I'll say is if you can't do 30 percent plus EBITDA at a million dollars, you're not ready to scale. Because that 1 million to 5 million journey is hell on wheels. You require HR support. You require sales support. You require, you require all the stuff that you can't afford anymore. And you got to do it with a team that doesn't know each other as well. And it's way harder, right? I mean, this is some of the stats are, are almost paralyzing when you think about it. Only 6% of companies get to a million in revenue. And less than... It, it depends what you read, but less than 10% of those who get to a million get to 5 million. And, wow. and I would say we don't, we don't really need, I, I, I'm going to say an unpopular opinion here. We don't need more help in the zero to 1 million. What we need is help to speed through that hell zone between one and 5 million, right? We need scalarators. We don't need accelerators, right? If you've got enough moxie, you'll get it off the ground. That's fine. Once you've got something that has a value prop, now let's put the turbocharger on it everywhere. Ben, do you want to jump in on scaling through that valley? I mean, I, I got a thumbs up there from you. So yeah. Um, 
there's a, there's a reason I'm losing all my hair. You know, I'm in that. I'm in that. It's all just sliding back from stress. It's just the onslaught, the fire hose, right? It's just like, ah. Well, you know, we're, we're exactly we're we're living that. Uh, we're living that on a day to day basis. What what Matt just referred to, and and uh, it is so true. You know, if you can't if you can't articulate your value prop, and and you know, you know, I wish I'd met Matt uh, a few years ago. Might have saved me some hair. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's so true. We're living it every day, and and um, determining that value prop, and um, figuring out how you're going to scale it uh, with people who might not necessarily be yeah. as you know they're not they're not with you since the beginning. They're not your best friends anymore. Um, they're you know these are folks who are coming to work from nine to five, and and uh, you got to look after them, and and uh, they've got to be motivated to to help you scale. And, and so knowing exactly what you do is. Is is such a is such a, a valid point, you know. And we're living it on both sides. You know, we've got a couple of startups here too. You know, one in the one in the medical space and one in the marine equipment space. And they're on the other side. And you know, Matt's exactly right. If you got enough moxie, you'll get something sort of over the line. Uh, but scaling those now is another is another sort of it's a whole different you know it's a whole different business approach. Um, and and being willing to being being willing to sit down and be honest about it is is probably the hardest thing as a founder. You know, we all have founder bias. We all believe we're you know our our thing, our widget's the best. Um, our baby's beautiful, and uh, it is the hardest thing. We see it all the time ourselves. We've fallen prey to it. Uh, we've lied to ourselves, and we've walked client lots of clients through that. You know, we've been the bearer of bad news, saying, "I'm you know I'm sorry that." there's nothing here really that we can see. Um, maybe if you modify it and put it in this market, then you'll be able to have an innovation there. Uh, but being, being willing and open to, um, to take those kind of approaches and, and on, and have that honesty is, is so important. And, uh, you know, folks like Matt, I know, I know you Chuck and, and Todd as well are, are very good at gently, uh, gently guiding folks in that direction too for you know be the first time i was called gentle ben thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know but but what i i mean what's really important ben brings a value prop to the market that he can solve complex problems but the outcome of that has vastly different values to different businesses right That's so right. i'll give you an example i was working on the 50 million dollar business just two weeks ago doing the strategic sessions okay we stumbled upon a quick hit that brought them $600,000 of annualized cash. And all they had to do was flick a button on one of the things that they didn't connect it before. Okay. There is nothing in the world that I can do for a million dollar company to find $600,000 of cash with a flick of a button. Yeah. I'm going through the same questions. I'm yeah. bringing the same value prop, but the value of it is dramatically different. And I'm trying to put it on two different extremes because if you are scaling and you don't know the problem you solve and the value for who, you can't communicate on that value bit. Therefore, you can't price it right. And if you don't price it right, you're not going to have enough profit in order to drive it. So you have to move from this sort of yes and, you know, yes, I can do it. Yes, I can do everything. I mean, Ben, he's got a, he's got a company that's basically industry agnostic, but it doesn't mean he should work in every industry. Right, because some can't get the value out of his service, and he needs to know that going in. I need to know that going in. Yeah. Right. So it's just a it's just a different approach. Yeah. Um, I want to get back on this issue of buy in, but before we do it, I'd like to maybe hear a bit more from Kevin in terms of Coltec. Uh, I know you recently implemented a solution to touch kind of every part of your organization. Maybe you can tell us about about that approach how you made that decision, the use of data, how to go, uh, lessons learned. Yeah. I mean, uh, listen, I, 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 uh, you talk about hair. I should have met Matt 20 years ago because, uh, I've been living that, right. We went from, you know, growth, growth, growth and, and expansion, other markets, trying to find good, competent people. Wasn't hard. Finding people you trust was a challenge. People that understood your culture, you know? So, so I just wanted to touch on that point. Yeah, so we, um, um, uh, you know, NSBI, uh, co we've done some great programs over the year. As, as a business, you're busy running your business, right? You don't have time to sort of look at 
I remember there was, uh, well, years where we run the business, uh, you know, 12 hours a day, then you work on your strategy and innovation on the weekends and, you know, while you're driving back and forth to work. So it's, it's always been nice to sort of have, you know, someone like Dave Copas pop in your office and say, Dave, geez, we're struggling right now. We want to get a program going, but just don't have the time, the effort. We're busy running our business. So here, he introduced us Ingenuity. Now we're doing a, a project with Ben on helping us with some of our processes. Um, a few years ago, he he came in the office and I said, you know, we'd like to do, an, uh, we're looking at doing an expansion, adding some equipment. We need to get some, you know, some process improvements. So he talked about the innovation rebate program. And uh, at the time, uh, and we still are, we, we do a capital investment every year, but you know, you look at a payback, right? Anybody looks at their payback, what's your investment going to yield? And typically it's two to three years. And if a project doesn't meet two to three years, it gets parked. What this innovation rebate program allowed us to do was to look beyond that and say, well, there's some there's some really cool equipment out there now that we can put in place to build ultra energy efficient products, right? But we're seeing that as five or ten years down the road. What this rebate program allowed us to do was invest in that equipment now, and lo and behold, the demand for ultra efficient products has grown higher than our expectations. So instead of scrambling now to put that equipment in place, we have it in place, and we're ready to meet that market. Um, there was a quick thing that Matt mentioned there on, um, you know, niche products and growing outside your market and you can't be all things to all people. Um, you know, we, we through our um, expansion to other markets have learned about some products like passive house products that are not big in Atlantic Canada, not big in our region, but are big in other parts of the world. So now we're focusing on that, understanding that can be a core strength for us. So, so anyway, back to your question, Chuck, the, um, you know, the program allowed us to um, uh, sort of bring in more equipment that we wouldn't have. But one of the things we've done at, at Coltec is tried, and one of our core values is innovation. We have quality service and innovation are our are, are, are core values. And what we try to do is keep innovation top of mind, top of thinking. People generally don't like change. And innovation has to start at the top. Yes, you can lead the way. you gotta, you got to chart new courses, that type of thing. But you need to bring your people along. You don't want them, you don't want to drag them along, kicking and screaming. You want them to sort of buy into it. So we, we talk about innovation when we do something. And innovation could be an idea that someone has on the shop floor. And you say to them, you know what? Great idea. That speaks to our core value of innovation. And we've introduced what we call the Innovation Award at the company where we celebrate uh, on a yearly basis and we talk about all the innovative things people have done throughout the year. It could be a process, it could be a new product, could be a tweak on the shop floor. And we put it out there and we celebrate it at our annual Christmas luncheon. And, and although it's been tough the last couple of years, but it, it's, it's really trying to keep that top of mind. Our KPIs relate to our core values, including innovation. And uh, uh, one of our KPIs is a sound, maybe sound kind of silly, it's called invoicing accuracy. And, and the reason for that is if we can keep our invoicing as simple and as efficient for our customers and take all the waste and noise out of that process, then we're being innovative and we're, we're adding value to our customers. It's another reason why they want to do business with you. So trying to keep innovation top of mind, talk about it, celebrate it, and pat people on the back when they do something innovative is, I, I believe, key to keeping that culture strong. Um, that was a great point, Kevin. That innovation doesn't necessarily have to be around your your product. It's in your process. It's in your people. It's in your ethos. It's in everything you do. You know, and it's it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. The, the the real dilemma for most organizations is creating alignment between the problem they solve for the customer outside in to the capabilities they have to the people being able to articulate where improvement could happen in current capabilities and right. how do you capture the hundreds of things you're going to run into every week while simultaneously ensuring that they're heard but we're only executing on a critical few because an organization can only handle so much change at once right and it's such a fine balance to connect strategic direction of where we're headed to operational and tactical improvement and innovation one of the biggest challenges I see, Matt, with companies, including ourselves, we went through this, is that you think you have to make, as the leader, you have to make every decision. And you grow to the point where if you continue to make all the decisions, your, your business stymies because you, yep. you need to bring people around you. And you need to give them enough rope to make, make a decision and, and applaud them when they make a great decision and just help them. Constructive criticism when they don't. So it's, But that's tough because when you're used to making decisions every day, things are coming at you, then you have to sort of start 
passing that out and trusting people to make the right decision, very tough, very tough. Been there. One of the hardest things to do. 100%. Yeah. Um, listen, we, we do have a bit of time. We're on until two. So if anybody in the chat's got some questions that they'd like to pose to any of our businesses, we'd, we'd love to take them. But I, I, I'd like to unpack this piece a little bit more about the buy-in, whether it's from the team or from the investors. Matt, do you want to go there? I, I, guys, you know, folks out here, I've that bad habit of saying guys, but folks, um, the change relies on buy-in. Buy-in doesn't come from agreeing on what. It comes from aligning on why, sequencing the biggest constraint or problem, so you're focusing the attention, and then getting people involved, especially those who deal with the problem every day, in working through it. There's a bunch of methodologies you can use. There's a Lean Six Sigma methodology. There's an Agile methodology. There's there's a hundred words for it. But at the end of the day, it's advanced problem solving around the number one problem the organization is having. Now, you can't get there with any authenticity if you don't connect it to why and you don't involve the people who need to be involved in the change. So, you know, I, there's there's a common misnomer that people don't like change. I'll tell you what people don't like. They don't like being changed. They love being involved in how it's going to be the new way, right? They love being involved in changing something. So, I mean, think about your own life, right? Like when you're going to change something, you have to have a bigger reason why. And if you think about an organizational process, it's no different than habits, right? And habits are hard to change, but if you have a bigger reason why, you can start to get more motivated. And then if you really dissect that, you can get to a root cause solution. But even if you have the right answer, but you do it without the people who need to know it, you got another whole game of translating that to them. I would rather have the fourth best solution driven by the team than the best one done to the team. Yeah. And the final bit that I'll say is how are you anchoring it? So most organizations will make a step change and then they just either audit it or hope it stays. Mm -hmm. But do you have a way for your organization to say every day, what prevented you from having a perfect day today? Because if you're going to drive innovation and improvement in an organization, you need a vehicle to give voice to your people. And they need to get the reps of spotting what's not going right. Now, yeah. I need to be able to know I'm going to see it but I don't always have to fix everything. I mean, we all know this. You're gonna run into more problems this week than you can fix in a lifetime. The goal of a leader is not to fix problems as fast as they can. The goal of a leader is to create the systemic approach to problem solving that allows you to pick the critical few and work with the people to solve the problem. If you do it any other way, you'll have to redo it over and over again. Right. So how do you do it with people? That's that's buy in. And, and the same thing happens with investors. You want to talk about investors. You want to talk about sales. You want to talk about any of that stuff. You got to connect on the problem first. Otherwise, you're just presenting a solution. And when you tell somebody an answer. All you get back is how much they like you or not. They're either going to agree with you because they like you and it doesn't really affect them anyway. Or they're going to call you a coconut and say, why didn't you think of all these things? Right. So it's just about creating a different environment for being heard, creating the muscle of seeing waste and then creating the avenue to lead change with people, not to people. It's interesting, Matt, you, uh, you know, you just you hit on a couple things there. And one of the things I always tell our managers and our team is that nobody knows the job better than the person doing it, whether on the 100%. shop floor, whether in the office. So ask them listen to them and then when they give you an idea say thank you and to yeah. what ben said or matt said you know people want to be part of the solution and, yeah. and they want to celebrate that and yeah. i like that i like that statement they don't want to be changed but they want to be part of change and if right. you involve them in the change you know what you're you're engaging people and you're fulfilling people and that has that's powerful and we're dealing with you know we got two engineers on here talking about leading companies okay so the the, the reality is engineers are already built in with seeing flow most of the world is not, okay? So how do you help people see flow? 
And you know, if you'll, the problem for most organizations is they're putting good solutions in place at the wrong part of the business. If I have a five to seven step process and I've got to improve that process, you go, okay, where do you start? And people go, well, you got to change it all. No. Okay. You got to change one. They'll go, well, go to the start. No, go to the constraint. So yeah. if the constraint is step five in your process and you make step four better, you've actually got good people with a good solution that just made your organization worse because they put more pressure on step five. They don't see it. And they're like, well, why did it fail? Well, yeah. it didn't fail because we didn't have good people. It didn't fail because we didn't have a good answer. It failed because we put it in the wrong area, right? And this is this, this, it's amazing to me how many organizations have great people with great intentions, making the organization just a little bit worse every day. <laughs> you know, I, I, I get a, a great example. We, you know, we have a production line, right? Process flow. And we would have the best workers creating the, 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 uh, the, 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 the biggest issues for our production line because they wanted to build product fast and move it ahead. Yep. So they were creating work in progress, piling up stuff and creating yep. problems for the next workstations to, yep. to teach them to slow mm -hmm. down and make sure that you're evenly flowing to production line. That's a challenge. Um, yeah. But and how do you have flex? Go go between. Like if you get that line, how do you get flex work go between? It's but it's it. Oh, for a lot of people, you know, you're going to say, okay, well, how do I do this without you know hiring Ben or Matt to do this? Okay, how you do this? Just flow out the steps. Where is the pile up? Wherever the pile up is, just put some brain power onto that pile up with the people who are in that area you'll come up with a better answer. You don't, you know, like, hey, I'm sure Ben and I would love to talk to you, but that's not the point here. The point is, how do you make your business better? That's right. And you, you do it with the people. If you yeah. find yourself giving answers all day long, it's just a matter of time before the, the, the whole castle comes tumbling down on you. You can't keep up that momentum. Yeah. And people have to see the impact of that. They have to see what they're doing. They have to see the benefit of it and be told about it and, and, and supported in that it's it otherwise they'll leave and it's, it. it's, there's more mobility now than ever before and so it's uh it's 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 become a fundamental part of what we do uh and, and in fact we end up coaching a lot of our clients okay well this this, this guy's really sharp you, you know you want to look after him because he, he's actually holding the key piece of your industry right here and we're helping him uh, you know improve this uh or he or she and um he's not feeling very appreciated right now so <laughs> you know you, you got to build stuff that backs people up and, and I would say if, if you know, I'll take three lines on that. What's your reflection process? Okay. Ray Dalio, one of the top hedge fund, hedge fund uh, billionaires in the world. If you don't follow him, please do. He has, a, he has a whole bunch of maxims. One of them is this. Pain plus reflection equals progress. Okay. Most people, when they hit pain, they deflect. Got to blame somebody for it. Can't be yours. Well, how do you get a reflection cadence going for your business, for your area, and for your people? And if you can keep people focused on where the business is going, if you can keep people focused on the output of their area, and if you can keep people focused on their development within it and get that all going in the same direction with a good reflection cadence, it's so critical to move forward with your business and create an environment where people are inspired to get there every day. Fully agree. It's, it's great to see lots of heads heads nodding and it certainly kind of makes my job easier but we are uh, we are very quickly getting to the to the end of this panel um, I, there's one question in the chat I do need to get to Kevin what kind of ultra efficient products do you have that innovates in the food and beverage industry do you have anything you can add there or? sorry ultra efficient products no we're typically just windows and doors for the residential like commercial uh, industry that's what I thought uh, okay. Well, listen, I think we could have gone on for hours. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give one quick answer that, that you said earlier and that Ben said for food and beverage. Folks, don't look at how you do work out. Look at how the client receives value in. And, mm -hmm. and as, as Kevin said, get rid of the tension and the abrasion points and add more value. You'll find a whole different slew of opportunities there. Yeah. Great. Well, listen, thank you to Kevin, to Todd, to Matt and to Ben. Uh, for your expertise and thank you for your insights. Uh, some excellent examples of, of approaches and innovation that businesses and, and stuff that you've lived and stuff that you've learned. So hopefully for everybody listening on the call, you don't need to lose your hair because people have already gone through that process and and, and, and we can learn from them. So uh, And listen, just from my 
behalf of, on behalf of ACOA, you know, we, we, we do have some programs to help as well. So do uh, take on the next uh, panels with NSBI, ACOA, ADC, and learn about some of the tools available. Uh, we do have a five minute break before we begin the second round of workshops sessions for the day. So just like this morning, uh, three new workshops running concurrently this afternoon uh, and repeat again at 3.30. So uh, there's great opportunities and great sharing opportunities coming up. So please uh, enjoy, enjoy the workshops. Thanks very much. Thanks. Hey, Kevin, great. Thank you. Yes. Cheers. Aliwa is really a, a data-driven uh, vessel owner and operator. We really saw a need for a company that's playing a role of being a facilitator of change and of progress in the industry. We uh, take our assets to see, to do a lot of science work and uh, data acquisition for uh, the industry with nonprofits, government organizations, with universities to try and better understand the ocean that's around us. It started out with a number of retired ex Navy professionals that came together and decided to start the company. But that experience has, has sort of grown and it's become uh, much more diverse. So we have engineers on staff, we have folks that are you know, ocean technologists, we have deep understanding in sensor deployment and sensor management engineering, vessel refits. We do touch on a lot of uh, different areas from a technical perspective. Our value is really derived out of our breadth of experience in a lot of different industries. We look at, for example, the, the clients that come on board our vessels that are looking to test and evaluate their, their technology and their equipment that they're developing. We can provide them feedback on you know, how something could work better, how it could be used better, um, which they can then go take back to their operation and, and put that into their planning and development. We're not just focused on getting ships to sea and, and having our clients on board. We're also focused on finding efficiency in our operations. We've got big aspirations for you know, moving our fleet towards a carbon neutral position. So we're looking at alternative fuels and alternative power sources on, on board our vessels. We're also moving towards a, a position of being more autonomous with our operations, being able to uh, reduce the number of folks that actually have to go to sea and maybe they can actually stay ashore, monitor some of that data that's being collected and process that ashore, which also means you can downsize your vessels. The Leeway Striker is a, a very unique vessel. So we've actually integrated a fairly sophisticated autopilot system that's on board right now, which has some learning capabilities within it has been able to learn how the vessel reacts to speed, to wind, to tide, all those different parameters that are affecting the vessel. And we can actually pre-program routes now, and the master is essentially just standing there and allowing the vessel to do what it needs to do and can intervene where needed. At this point, we call it uh, autonomous capable. The biggest opportunity, I think, for leeway from a market perspective is the offshore wind market in the US. And we see ourselves playing a role in sort of a, a broad range of activities there. You know, I would say that, that that's our biggest opportunity um, and it's on us to make sure that we can execute on that and actually uh, get the work done.